to Keeping Friendship Magic, the Odd Pony out. Uh, my name is Forward Progress. I am a social scientist from the uh, state of Pennsylvania. I traveled 12 hours just to get here to talk to y'all about ponies and science. So, I'm glad some people showed up to listen. Hooray! <laughs> um, so, the uh, basically, uh, one, I've, I've run Keeping Friendship Magic since uh, 2015. Uh, this is my first time in Chicago. Um, I've never been through your city before. It's it's nice, I will say. Um, it was great to see, it would it would be nice to see it when I haven't been on the road for you know eleven and a half hours. Sometime I'll have to try that. I mean, I did see the inside of O'Hare one time, but that doesn't count. <laughs> so. Um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, I've been wanting to bring this to more conventions. I've been so happy to get the privilege to present to y'all here at Winnie City. Um, I have this belief, and I hope a few of you uh, share it with me, and it's that I genuinely believe that bronies have the power to change the world. Uh, I, I see nods and claps. Yay! You are my people. Thank you. <laughs> but I really do. Uh, one thing, uh, basically what I do is I study fandom from a social science perspective. Um, and I believe that there is a lot we can learn through fandoms that we can use to benefit the world, benefit our lives, benefit us as people to bring ourselves closer. So what we're going to talk about in today's panel, which is the Odd Pony app, we're going to talk about how we make friends, uh, the science behind, uh, behind it, how and why we make friends, why it's important to appreciate our differences, and some barriers that keep us from friendship. Kind of ways we can learn to be stronger friends for one another and ways that we can um, make new friends, which I think people in this fandom know, I think they like friendship. <laughs> I, I, it's something I've noticed anyway. So we're going to start talking about how we make friends, and in order to start talking about it, I'm going to bring up uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, you may have seen her walking around the con, actually. Is she even moving? Hmm. Sedimentary. Huh? This is a sedimentary rock. That's really fascinating, isn't it, girls? Making friends, and I feel like Maud is the uh, perfect pony to discuss uh, making friends because of how much Pinky really tried to get them all to become friends. Obviously, it was difficult for Maud to make friends at first, or at least friends in this case. So, we're gonna do a little, a little fun thing, and let's do. How many people I got in this round? Let's call. All right, let's split into teams of two. You don't count because you know this, but <laughs> it's my girlfriend. <laughs> I love you. But we'll split into teams of two. Everybody, let me know when y'all are ready. <laughs> Now you don't have to turn them around. If you make a group of three, it's okay. This is literally the most I've ever seen anybody do this when I've done this. All right, so. You can join any group, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Raise your hand if you actually got up out of your seat. Okay, you can put them down. Raise your hand if you didn't move an inch. <laughs> Congratulations, you just proved science. <laughs> Proximity. When we, when we go and we look for making friends, the number one thing is who is here, who's near us. 
So a lot of times think about in school when you had it split into groups like what we just tried. How many of you turned to the person next to you like, you wanna do this? <laughs> it's, it's a thing because our brains are kind of trained to do what's easiest for us. You might think after the end of this, or especially if you come to Sunday's panel, um, our brains are a little lazy sometimes. It tries to do whatever it can. It's a beautiful, powerful machine, but at the same token, it tries to find any shortcut it can to get you from point A to point B. Now, uh, going along with proximity, um, something is called the mere exposure effect, which essentially says the more you're exposed to somebody, the more likely you are to become friends with them. Let's put it in the context of a convention like this. Um, somebody who's, like, let's say you were at the guest of honor panel earlier and you sat in the same row as somebody and then you come to this panel tonight and you see that same person be like, you're much more likely just from that exposure, seeing them once, seeing them again, to go up and say like, oh hey, or like, I remember seeing you or something like that. And sometimes that's all it takes to broach that gap to become friends. <laughs> this one's an obvious one, but similarity. We do look, tend to look for people who are more similar to us. So people have similar interests, similar tastes, because they can definitely have that something to build a relationship upon. Now, there's a couple of girls in the series that I can point to that definitely had some similarities that really brought them together in the first place. Oh. <laughs> wow, that is an amazing cutie mark. <laughs> nice try. Blank, blank. <laughs> You got a problem with blank flanks? <gasps> I said, you got a problem with blank flanks? The problem is it means she's like totally not special. No, it means she's full of potential. It means she could be great at anything. The possibilities are like endless. She could be a great scientist or an amazing artist or a famous writer. She could even be mayor of Ponyville someday. And she's not stuck being stuck up like you two. <laughs> hey, this is my party. Why are you two on her side? Because... <gasps> you don't have any cutie marks either? I thought I was the only one. We thought we were the only two. The CMC engaged in what I like, uh, in something called social comparison theory. It was coined in the 70s by a man named Leon Festinger. Hmm. Essentially what it is is way that we process information and try to figure out where we stand in the world, where our place is on this planet and this crazy society we live in, is through comparison. Is basically you're looking and analyzing the world and going, okay, where do I stand in relation to this, to this, to this? How does a tree compare to a rock? I, I just went there because of Mod and Mudbriar. But... <laughs> oh, snap. I ship it. Yeah. They shipped it. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody else have to go look at the credit sequence, by the way, to make sure that it wasn't it was Jim Parsons? Yeah. Yeah. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I think we would have heard about it, but I still have to look. Uh, the, uh, the actor did such a good job. Anyway. I went to IMDb. Yeah. And then I went to that guy, and he's like, like four movies, a couple zombie movies. Yeah, movies. yeah. I don't know, maybe this is this big break. Yeah, really. We'll see if we see them back yeah, again. So anyway, um, so you do it for things like that. We also do it to kind of figure out where we stand in the terms of the social world. Um, so at the beginning of that clip, Apple Bloom is trying to compare herself to Silver Spoon and Diamond Tiara, which isn't going to work. <laughs> Let's face it, especially at that point in the series, there is no way. There, uh, we didn't have Diamond Tiara's, you know, redemption moment yet. Speaking of which, don't we need another Diamond Tiara episode? Seriously. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> um, you know, that didn't happen. They were still very stuck up, very much not about what Apple Bloom was about. And she found Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo came, they saw what she was going through, and they stood up for her, and they had that that new comparison now. I have somebody I can relate to. I have somebody that I can feel I'm on a similar social standing to, so I can find my place in the world with these girls, and then they become the CMC, of course, and 
low their travels have gone far and wide and in interesting directions, including the dream world. But I digress. So all this being said, you know, you put all this together, let's go back to Maud and think about how that episode ended and how that connects with everything. Pinkie Pie, we're so sorry we hurt your feelings by not bonding with Maud right away. And Maud, we're sorry that you felt the only way to spare Pinkie Pie's feelings was to leave Ponyville early. Mm -hmm. We've seen how much you care about Pinkie Pie. First hoof. Pinkie Pie's happiness means as much to us as it does to you. And we're sorry we couldn't see it sooner. The thing that makes us click and creates a special bond between us is how much we all love Pinkie Pie. Aw, shucks. That's a pretty great thing to have in common, if you ask me. What do you think, Maud? Sure. What's wrong? Sorry, darling. I think we all just thought you'd be a bit more excited about this. Are you kidding me? I've never seen her more excited in my entire life! I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't show my enthusiasm for things quite in the same way my sister does. Uh, we noticed. And we're totally cool with it. <laughs> I love that. And I also love when Pinky in the background does this at the end, because I'm like, how did that not become a giant meme? <laughs> like, seriously. So we talked a little bit about similarity, obviously, and making friends through finding those common bonds. And one of the great things about everyone in this room is you already have a common bond with everyone here. Pony! It's an easy, it's an easy talking point. Feel free to come in, I promise we won't bite. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So, but it's not just about finding the similarities. It's also about appreciating the differences we have with one another. And there are no two ponies I could think are better suited to have this discussion than Applejack and Rarity. Let's face it, these two are the odd couple of My Little Pony. Tell me you wouldn't watch that sitcom spinoff. <laughs> I totally would. Mm. So appreciating differences. Obviously, these two have had to go on quite a journey to learn how to get along over the seasons. Now we're going to talk about them from season one to start with, and then we're going to take a little journey forward with them. So season one started like this. Look, I'm sorry, all right? What was that? I said I'm sorry. I should have listened to you when you noticed where this here branch would end up. Your annoying attention to detail would have saved us from this whole mess. But right now, you need to stop being so dang fussy, picking up all those little things, and help me move the one big thing in here that actually matters. Please! Uh, but I'll get all icky. Come, Sarnie. What the? You, I mean, yes. Ickiness is often a side effect of hard work, but y'all need to get over it on the count of I just can't fix this mess I made myself. I need your help. Mm 
better? <laughs> Thanks. I honestly, I really love that episode. <laughs> anytime they put AJ and Rarity together, for the most part, I should say, there is one exception. But anytime <laughs> they put them together, there's just some magic that happens. Uh, any rare Jack shippers? Okay, cool. I got one. Hooray. So, in the world of My Little Pony, the biggest thing to point out is cutie marks, because every pony in Equestria has a unique talent, something that makes them special, something that makes them different. Now, honestly, I wish we had that, because it would have made this whole figuring out what I wanted to do with my life thing so much easier. <laughs> I mean, like, the CMC now have their kitty marks, and they have a path. If I had a path that young, I, I, I would have been so much happier. <laughs> That's, I digress, I digress. But let's face it, everybody is a different talent, and that works like uh, in, in the real world, too. People have unique abilities and unique talents. And the thing about it is uniqueness equals better problem solving. If you, have, if you surround yourself with people who have different talents, you have more abilities to solve the problem, just like we saw in that clip. Applejack couldn't fix that by herself. She knew that she needed Rarity. And Rarity had the ability to, all she needed was kind of that encouragement and the, you know, and the consarnet-ness <laughs> of AJ. Now, hopefully, everybody can kind of take a little something away from what we learn from the show and what we talk about at these conventions, and it won't take a disaster such as a massive tree crashing into your house that to need to be able to figure out coming together like this. Hopefully, knock on wood. But sometimes it does take that, and those are the moments where you can make real, true, long-lasting friendships, like what Applejack and Rarity have now to this day. We can't be good at everything. I wish I could be. I'm good at standing here and talking about science and ponies. I'm not really good at building bridges, so I would be terrible if you tried to hire me to do some work over here in Chicago on those bridges. I, I, Y'all would die. I'm sorry. Yeah. It just wouldn't end well, and I, I would feel bad for the rest of my life. So. Another thing about appreciating differences is they can really help you out when you need them and you don't realize you need them. When you need some pony to turn to, you ever have that time where you are so trapped in your own head and it takes a friend to just be like, you're doing this to yourself, snap out of it, I see this. And sometimes they have to do some pretty extreme things. <clears throat> Why wouldn't I be? Because you would never dress like that. You like fashion and high society and fancy things. And I can like plowing fields and hauling apples just as much. But you don't. How do you know what I like? Because I know you. Well, maybe you don't know me as well as you think. And I suppose it's just a coincidence that Trenderhoof seems so interested in country life too? I don't know what you were getting at. Well, then I guess I'll just have to show you. a joke? Why, Rarity, whatever would make you think I was joking? Because you would never wear an ensemble like that. You like plowing fields and hauling apples. And I can like fashion just as much. But you don't. Well, maybe you do not know me as well as you think. Fine, but I got a whole festival to plan. So if you're going to start modeling, just get on with it. Life is a festival, and you should celebrate it by looking just like me, because I'm a trend-setting fashionista. You are a trend-setting fashionista? Why, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever... I mean, good for you. I, on the other hoof, couldn't care less how I look, long as I get the chores done. Oh! Is that so? Yes, indeedy doodle. <gasps> Not me. My mane needs to be perfectly coiffed at all times. Well, my mane is 
full of dust and split ends. My hooves are so polished, you can see your reflection in them. My hooves are cracked and dry from working in the fields. I'm so fashion forward. I wear droopy drawers. I smell like rosebuds. I love being covered in mud. the rarity I know. Oh, Applejack. I'm sorry I said all those things. You're a true friend who probably knows me better than I know myself. I don't know what I was thinking wearing this ridiculous outfit. I kind of know how you feel. Oh, but you were just trying to help me see how silly I was being. And you were right. I never thought we'd see the day. <laughs> and then it happened. <laughs> <laughs> The Applejack's ability, oh, I went ahead. Applejack's ability to uh, kind of transform. When we first saw her, Look Before You Sleep was episode eight. And she could not stand wearing that, that uh, frilly outfit, which was, let's face it, it was a little ridiculous. But she looked like she wanted just nothing. Like she was just, I, I can't do this, I can't be this. And then she goes in episode 78, Simple Ways, to willingly put on something, get her mane all quaffed up, all precious, polish her hooves, and parade out on a stage just to show Applejack how much, or not Applejack, uh, Rarity, I'm sorry, how much she was stuck in her own head. How much, you know, she needed to see this. Applejack knew what Rarity needed, and sometimes that's the most important thing. Having somebody who is different than you can see something from a different angle, a different perspective. I've had a couple of friends like that who have been able to kind of call me out sometimes, and I've been that friend for some of, some of my close friends. We need that in our lives so we can kind of check ourselves, because, again, we're not perfect. Hashtag come see my panel on Sunday called We're Not Flawless. But anyway. <laughs> so we're going to move on from them. And um, but we're going to talk about this pony right here. I love Moon Dancer, guys. I do. Now, we're going to talk about barriers to friendship with her. And when I put this panel together first back in 2015, I've been doing it for, gosh, three. This is year four, isn't it? Wow, this is crazy. But um, when I did it, I didn't have Moon Dancer in here yet because the episode hadn't aired. I thought I had this all put together, had everything all set, and then all of a sudden, this uh, amazing episode called Amending Fences comes out. And all I could think of to say was one thing, thanks, M.A. Larson. <laughs> <laughs> I was, it's, it's one of my favorite episodes he ever wrote. So we're gonna talk about barriers to friendship, and we're gonna talk about it with Moon Dancer. And, because let's face it, Moon Dancer really was just like, put up a wall around herself in this episode. Did you have something? What, Amending Fences? I haven't heard that, but... Either way, we're gonna go with the joke for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mitch is an interesting man, is he not? Um, so, first thing we're going to talk about is social anxiety. Um, I really saw this with Moon Dancer in this because Moon Dancer had so much anxiety, even when you know when when Twilight and Minuet and them come knock on the door. She's like, "No, I just go away. I don't want any part of this. I want to be by myself. I can't handle people." She really shut herself off after Twilight didn't show up to that party, and I can relate to that. Um, so I actually have generalized anxiety disorder. I've had it since I was about yay, and it's really put a lot of barriers up in my life. Granted, I'm medicated for now, everything's great. I went from being unable to get out of bed at times to being able to present in front of a room of people, so yay. But um, 
but I really saw some of myself in her and the way that she shut herself off. You know, there's something about about this that you ever feel like this? <laughs> So there's something called the illusion of transparency, and um, I talk about that and a little bit of a flip to it, what I call the illusion of opaqueness. And what it boils down to is the illusion of transparency uh, basically is when you're in a room of people and you feel like nobody sees you, like you're invisible to everybody. Like wallflower? Like, kind of. Kind of, except she kind of did that to herself. But that's... <laughs> But, but similar, yes. Um, you know, you're just invisible to the world. No matter what you do, you won't matter to anybody. I like to also talk about the converse to this, which falls under that, but I like to just refer to it as the illusion of opaqueness in that that clip especially showcases being in that place and thinking that no matter what you do, everybody's going to notice it and everybody's going to judge you for it. And I've experienced that, I know, a lot in my life. We've seen it with Fluttershy, and then you have, you know, you have a little bit of, I think, this with, uh, with Moondancer to an extent, of a, she tried to put herself out there, and now she's gonna be in around people, it's gonna be like, you know what? I'm not gonna put myself back in there. I'm gonna let myself, I'm gonna keep myself in. So, let's see how that episode God, ended. This party can't make up for the way I hurt you, but please, don't let my mistake be the reason you can't be friends with any pony else. We were your friends then, and we'd be honored to be your friends now. <laughs> what? That's the librarian, the bookseller, my sister. You've got a lot of friends, Moondancer. I'm sorry, Moondancer. I've faced magical creatures, the end of Equestria, all sorts of things. But seeing how my actions affected you, that was one of the worst feelings I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you, Twilight. I never realized how much I needed to hear that. A couple of big takeaways I take from that episode, one of which being that Twilight had to leave or else we would not, like, Nightmare Moon would not have been defeated. So if you want to get technical about it, Twilight really didn't do anything wrong. And that's one of these things is you can do nothing wrong and still hurt someone. And being able to recognize that and being able to accept that Twilight kept friendship magic in a huge way in this episode because again, it's like she she realizes Okay, my actions did hurt somebody it was what I had to do But something still hurt someone and instead of being like like why are you so mad? Why are you so upset? She's like I'm gonna make this make this pony feel better. I'm going to make up for this so it's it's something that's really stuck with me since I saw this episode and you know and when you have somebody making those gestures, it's important to kind of remind yourself, like, there can still be people out there. It's easy to shut ourselves off at times, but there are still people out there who want to help. So, so we're going to talk about another barrier to friendship from, an, from a, the opposite perspective. We're going to talk about stigma. And we're going to talk about that with my friend Spike and Crystal, I mean, Vorax. So... <laughs> Stigma really gets here, um, obviously, in a big way in this episode, and, um... No, wait! Come back! This is unexpected. The ice is pretty slippery. 
I wouldn't want you to get hurt because of me. You saved me? It's okay. I know you don't want to be friends. Wait! I don't understand. Changelings are supposed to be evil, right? Evil? Oh, not me. All I've ever wanted is a friend. I'm Thorax. I can't believe you want to help me. Why? Hasn't any pony ever just been nice to you? <sighs> oh, sorry, sorry! Kindness like that kind of brings it out. Do you still want to be my friend? Of course! So, Spike in that episode... First of all, best Spike episode. <laughs> yeah. Period. Yeah. Flat out. Okay. There's, the, 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 there's no argument. <laughs> but in this, in, in this episode, we see Thorax is kind of, Thorax suffers from social stigma. Um, now, I kind of have it attributed to Goffman. He's the first one person to, Irving Goffman, a, a sociologist, and I can't even remember the year. This was ages ago at this point. But um, he's the first person to actually use the term, I think, in literature, but the term had been around for a little bit. But basically, this invisible perception of you, just because of who you are, what you are, there is a social perception that you are less than, or you are evil, or you are wrong. And a lot of us have had to face it. Let's face it, as bronies, we've been stigmatized. We've been called some not-so-good things. Um, let's see, what, what are some, you know, we've been called, um, you know, I'd see, I've been called, uh, I've seen pedophile, I've seen, um, you know what my favorite one was? That bronies were the, uh, the, the sign of the apocalypse. <laughs> it's real. There's a video online. Where, uh, there's a video, a video online. Um, yeah, that we were the end of manliness as we know it, something like that. I, I've seen them all, and um, I'll tell you, um, I was afraid to kind of come out of my brony closet at first. <laughs> Um, because I was afraid of the backlash. And what's really ironic is that, about that, is I had already come out of the closet before in my life. And it didn't make this any easier. Um, you know, whether, whatever it is, we all have something about us that we can't change, and we're always worried how other people are gonna perceive us. And initially, Spike sees that he's a changeling, and he goes to run. <coughs> Luckily, well, I don't know how you want to say it, he almost dies, but Thorax saves him, and he's able to kind of, he's able to see past it. <coughs> Not every pony is able to, and it's one of those things that with social stigma is it's while you may be able to get along with them one by one, it's sometimes hard when you're under the microscope of a large social situation to be able to um, stick with your gut, stick with your perception. Oh, she's so beautiful. There's so much love around her. I... 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 I'm so... Oh, sorry. I, I can't... can't... Stop! Spike! Get away from the changeling! Wait! No! You don't understand! This changeling replaced your friend to get close to the baby. What other explanation could there be? I... I don't know. After it! Don't let the changeling escape! Yeah, being stigmatized sucks. <laughs> and it's hard, and I can, I can speak to it from times in my life where I didn't understand things, you know, and I was on the other side of it. And it takes a big person to, first of all, admit when you're wrong. I think one of the biggest lessons anybody can take away in life is being able to admit, you know what, I can be wrong and it's okay. Because that's the first step to changing and making things right and making things better. Um, you know, for example, when I first found out that that bronies were a thing, I was like, this is really weird. Like, I don't get it. And then I watched an episode. 
and then I watched another, and then I watched another, <laughs> and here I am. So, I was wrong, but that's okay. And I, I am willing to admit it, um, because, you know, what a better place this world would be if we aren't, weren't all just trying to stroke our egos and we could actually get down to the nitty gritty problems and really focus. And we do that by, you know, really taking a look at when we're right, when we're wrong, and, you know, we don't have to boost ourselves up that much. You, I think there's a lot more power in being able to say to somebody, you know what, I was wrong, but I'm going to make it better now. So Spike was wrong in that moment. You know, he was scared. It's understandable. We all go through it. Societal pressure is big. It's hard. It gets pushed on you. And it's this invisible force. You can't fight it. You can't just punch it, you know? <laughs> it's hard to fight back against. But Spike gets brave, and he does in the end. I don't know what else we can do. I do. Spike, what are you doing? Get away from that thing. No, he's not a thing. His name is Thorax, and he's my friend. Spike, I'm so proud of you. You are? Of course. You're a celebrity here in the Crystal Empire, and you just risked all of it for a friend. I can't imagine anything more brave than that. As the Princess of Friendship, I try to set an example for all of Equestria. But today, it was Spike who taught me that a new friend can come from anywhere. I guess every pony still has things to learn about friendship, even me. And if Spike says Thorax is his friend, then he's my friend too. Thank you. That's when Spike really became Spike the Brave and Glorious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he really had to stand up for something. You know, you know, you, you see some of the other ones, because even at the end of Equestria Gains when he's like, but I just did what comes natural to me or whatever, he had to overcome some deep, deep-rooted, you know, let's face it, hatred for changelings throughout society and really push for them to accept him. And, you know, and we got our glorious new Bug King out of it. <laughs> And uh, I, for one, welcome our new changeling overlord. <laughs> so, I have one other pony to talk about with uh, whatever time I have left. I think I have a good ten minutes, so hopefully I can get through everything. I've been trying to rush. Sorry, everyone. Um, oh, overcoming stigma. We already talked about that. So, um, again, it's just being willing, willing and able to listen to what's reality as opposed to just what you were fed your entire life. That's a big thing. You know, we're socialized in a certain way and not dissing anybody's parents, guardians, anybody who socialized you, educators, anything. We're not always right, we're not always perfect and what worked in one generation will not work for the next generation. You know, um, you know growing up, it, it's amazing to me how much in my lifetime, you know, I grew up you know, I, I was in the closet in high school and I was like, oh my God, everybody, like, I'm going to get killed for being gay. And now I just want to see like a gay love story in major cinemas not that long ago. By the way, go see Love, Simon. It's amazing. But <laughs> thank you. Um, but yeah, like, it's amazing. And it, what it takes is people being able to look at it and being like, it's not right to oppress these people. We have to set an example. We have to make the right call. It's tough to do, but it's the right thing to do, and I think we all feel better when we do it. So this is the pony I want to talk about. Yay! So Luna had a really big episode, and ha there was a strong theme in it, and I don't know how many people really fully caught on to it, but this one hit me real close. I think it's feeding on your guilt, Princess Luna! If that is so, then perhaps that is how it grew strong enough to escape in the first place. Say what now? I created the Tantibus to give myself the same nightmare every night. <laughs> to punish myself for the evil I caused as Nightmare Moon. But why would you do that? To make sure I never forgave myself 
for how much Equestria suffered because of me. But it seems I have not learned my lesson. For now I have only made you suffer more. The theme of self-harm in this episode. While this episode had a lot of fun stuff, I mean, Princess Big Mac for the win, um, Scootaloo's giant wings, giant derpy, I mean, you name it, it has had it all. But man, did that theme of self-harm just, ooh, it just, it just hit me over the head and was like, wake up, <laughs> look at this. You know, it, it was, it, Luna's pretty much most people's favorite princess. Um, I would let you guess later who mine is. It's not Luna, actually. But um, the fact of how Luna caused herself harm every night, you know, this is a reality that people do hurt themselves intentionally. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's mental. For me, it was mental. You know, uh, like I said already, I've had generalized anxiety disorder my entire life. I've also had clinical depression my entire life. Um, I have more medical conditions too, but we're not gonna. <laughs> um, bottom line is, I'm actually okay though, don't worry too much. Like I'm actually happy now, like I'm medicated, everything's taken care of, chemical balances are good. It just really sucked growing up as a child. You know, going through stigma battles, not being able to like myself, and I had a lot of internal self-harm. Now, I like to bring up stigma versus reality because there is this stigma out there that people just hurt themselves for attention. And the evidence just does not, the studies, the data does not back this up, flat out. There might be some people out there who might do it, but for the most part, these are people who are dealing with things and this is how they know how to do it. It's one of those things there, in, in certain ways, it's almost can be described as a way to protect your self-esteem, as crazy as that sounds. I had somebody, I had a professor one time say to me that about 90% of human behavior can be explained as an attempt to um, protect your own self-esteem and your own self-image. And it's kind of one of those things of like a, I'm not going to let the world bring me down, I'm going to do it to myself. And this safeguards me. It sounds crazy, but I've lived it. We, people do it. It's a reality and a lot of people suffer and I think the biggest thing here is a lot of it Especially in Princess Luna's case. It's a coping mechanism She's dealing with a lot of shame over what she did as Nightmare Moon a lot of guilt for what she did um, I mean we saw in the season 5 finale what would have happened had the main six not stopped Nightmare Moon you know we had She was going to banish Celestia to the moon Rule in Darkness, um, Crazy Rainbow Dash Mohawk. <laughs> I actually like that look on her. But that and that really cool warrior wing with the metal wing, that's awesome too. But I digress. So for Luna, you know, this is her way of coping. She basically said she did this to punish herself. She did this as a reminder so she would never do it again. So it was her only way that she felt that she could cope with it. There is a theory known as general strain theory by a man named Robert Merton, which basically says we have strains on us, whether a lot of them are internal and you have external strains too. So the external strains would be, could be a number of different things like bills will be a strain on you. And you know, and uh, say you've got, um, if you're having an argument with your significant other, that would be a strain. If you add all that up, you know, everything from day to day life. And essentially, what strain theory, and I've used this scene to describe a lot of things, especially in criminology, believe it or not, but I really think it holds, mostly in this self-harm debate, is you reach a point where the strains on you, internally and externally, it, you reach that point where your bucket is full, and it needs to spill out somewhere. And for a lot of people, it does this in that, I can't take it anymore, I need a release, I have too much I need to cope with, and I need an outlet, and it happens. And the most important thing for me, and I, you see it in this episode, that I think is make sure that people know that you can be there for them. And if you are experiencing it, know you can talk to people. That's what friendship is all about, is just having, is having someone to talk to. Don't be afraid to ask for help. 
it took me years to get through my anxiety and depression. Eventually one day I went, you know what, I'm going to a doctor and I'm going to fix myself. And I asked for help and I got it and it's the only way I'm standing here today. So it can be done. So, got one last clip from this. Oh wait, also depression, but I already mentioned that. But of how this episode My creation happened. is about to turn the world into a living nightmare! But look at what you're doing! Nightmare Moon would have wanted the Tantibus to turn Equestria into a nightmare! You're doing everything you can to stop it! Don't you see? That proves you're not the same pony you were then! Every pony who knows you knows that Nightmare Moon is in the past! We all trust you, Luna! Do you trust us enough to believe we're right? I do! The beautiful thing about the way that episode ends is that for a lot of us, you know, sometimes we might feel like we don't have that many friends. Well, you know what? I come to conventions to meet friends, so I will make friends with every single one of you in this room. I have business cards. I, you can come up and get one afterwards. Um, I, I love making new friends. I have more friends now than I ever have. And you know why? It's this community. Because this community is supportive. It believes in the magic of friendship. It believes that by being together and supporting one another, we can get through this crazy world together. And sometimes that's all we need is that little nudge and those little supports. So how to keep friendship magic? Obviously, like I said, show your support for your friends. Remind them that you're there. You can't always be there every minute of every day, but let them know somebody does care. Somebody's there for them to listen. Give them gentle nudges in conversation. For some people, they get really balled up. It's really hard to talk, especially in new social situations. Again, just gentle little things that reminds them there are people here to support you. And you know, and if it's hard, and it's, sometimes it's hard for people to believe in themselves, but you know what? Any anime fans in the room? Yes, Go on! I know you can do it, buddy! Uh, but I don't! Listen, Simone, don't believe in yourself. Huh? Believe in me! Believe in the Kamina who believes in you! What's that mean? <sighs> right, I'll try. You have trouble believing in yourself? Guess what? You're awesome, you're a brony, you made it to this convention, you made it to my panel, I believe in you. So if you can't believe in yourself, believe in the me that believes in all of you. And that is what I call keeping friendship magic. Thank you all for dealing with my technical difficulties and coming and listening to the talk. Um, I have one more panel this weekend on Sunday. Um, it is a brand new panel I'm debuting for the first time at this convention called Keeping Friendship Magic, We Are Not Flawless. So we're going to talk about the idea of uh, what we think being perfect is all about and uh, the standards we hold each other to. So uh, otherwise, thank you for coming, and I hope to see you all around the con. Yeah. Yay. <laughs>